Um, Adam, you, you told me design didn't come into play at your company in a serious way until about three years ago. Why did you change your approach? And when you changed it, what, how did the product creation, product development process change because of it? So about three years ago, we became big believers in this whole concept of consumerization of the enterprise, where the standards uh, for business software users would become similar or the same as consumer software standards. And so because, we recognized- Because people got used to better looking stuff and better working stuff? People were using their mobile phones and their personal applications to get work done. So there started to be this gray line between what was for consumer use and what was for business use. And so the standards were bleeding over from the consumer market to the business market. And we said, we gotta get ahead of this or we're gonna be left way behind. And three years ago, we took, made a concerted effort to understand what is the best of consumer UX, consumer design, established our own standards, took about a year to do that, and once that was done, we then have designed everything since then against that, including migrating all of the existing screens to that new format. And so the development process changed, fundamentally changed because Absolutely. of Absolutely, dramatically changed, where it became all about what's the end user experience first, and from there, we write the rest of the specs and do the agile development based on understanding what, what the design is first, and then coding second. Um, Jason, you do both software and hardware, so you're involved in design on two ends. How, how does it work on, e on, you know, on either side? Yeah, so on, on the software side, I think very similar to what Mike uh, described, where we try and start product engineering and design all at the same time. And one of the advantages of doing that is that you know, designers often can move faster than you can write code. Uh, so getting early prototypes and seeing how some of your ideas might look on the screen and in motion is really, really helpful. Uh, on the hardware side, our, our product cycles run about 15 months. Uh, and so, uh, and, and the, the exciting and challenging thing about hardware is that decisions you make at the very front of the process you're gonna live with uh, all the way through shipping and all the way through the life cycle of the product. So we try and start that very early and go through a lot of iterations before we lock things down. Um, it, it seems like in the hardware side there's an obvious uh, difference, which is whatever design choices uh, you're making are going to have an impact on the cost of your device. So when does that, when does the reality check that, oh my gosh, this, you know, little button I want to put in there uh, costs too much and I can't do it, and then yeah. what do you do? So I think that, that for, for us, that's something that you live with throughout the process. You, know, you kind of start up with this big uh, start off with this big grandiose vision of building the perfect product, the perfect camera, uh, and then uh, reality sets in. It's not just, uh, it's not only about uh, cost and, and the physical aspects of that, but it's about, you know, do these parts exist in the supply chain ecosystem? Could I actually buy the resolution screen that I want? So I, I describe it as it's a constant battle that you're kind of fighting every day uh, all the way through ship. And then once you ship, you've uh, a kind of typical metric is that you try and uh, cost down your, your bill of materials cost by about 5 to 10 percent every quarter. So it's an ongoing thing. And, and is it something where you start with this amazing vision of the ideal thing and, and then kind of scale it up, scale it down as, as reality sets in? I, I think for, for us, we try and stay as close to the idealized. We, we, we try and form a, uh, an informed view of what the idealized product is going to be and then and then try to manage decisions at the margin rather than you know, blue skying it and having to, to really scale back our expectations. Hmm. So what about on the software side? Do you, do you have this sort of blue sky, we'd love to do this, but there's constraints or, or is that The biggest not? issue we have is the complexity of the requirements in the first place. So the, the requirements company, of your product. So meaning, for example, if there's a new feature that's being added to the system, the clients want a certain level of configurability and capability, so the functionality itself is relatively complex, but you want the experience for the end user to be extremely simple. And how do you get those two things to work together? How do you end up with, essentially, simplicity through this level of complexity? I think we start with a set of consumer desires, wants, like 
what are you trying to solve? Why, why is this a pain point for users? I don't, we don't really start from constraints on the, on the software side as much. Uh, I do agree the organizing principle becomes very important. So one of the things that we did, for example, you do put product design and engineering all together, and that has a very big impact. I, I think a lot of organizations previously existed in worlds of sort of functional, yeah. and now you find product organizations look a lot more like startups. I, I'll ask you about organization in, in a moment. Um, but let me first uh, sort of another sort of preliminary question. but. What do you strive for? Is it beauty? Does beauty matter in enterprise software? Do you strive for functionality, for simplicity, for a combination of all those? It's really you want all three things. You want it to be beautiful and engaging. You want it to be simple, so in the case of enterprise software, you're not getting support calls. You're not getting questions from the users. You don't need user guides anymore or help desks. And you want it to handle the functional requirements, so it's got to be capable as well. I think you're striving. I mean, a high-level goal is always customer empathy, right? You've got to understand what they want, and design is really about empathy. It's not about beauty. I think people get, it's, it's not necessarily about how it looks as much as how it kind of works, fits together all the different bits and pieces, right? It's, um, it, it's tricky to define. Yeah, you want simplicity. You want, you want all those things. But if, if at the end of the day, someone's using your product, if they have a good experience of using it, that, that's, that's the end criteria. So for different applications, that'll mean different things, right? And so, right, so you've got some, you know, Yahoo Weather, it's beautiful, right? And it's great, there's beautiful pictures, whatnot. In an enterprise product, are you trying to, to decrease the pain? You talked about empathy. Is it about making it le the least painful possible for me, the user, or do you also want to incorporate some of that? I think you want, I mean, you want, you want people's day to be as filled with beauty as possible, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of it's unfalsifiable, but at the same time, we're there to get a job done. We're a tool. Mm -hmm. And so the quickly we can get in, get out, the more easily they can get that job done. If we can send them home a little earlier at the end of the day or a little happier, then that's, you know, that's sort of the, the end scenario you're aiming for. And then you take those sort of principles and then try to actually turn that into you know, screens and systems and flows and everything else. But, mm -hmm. I don't think it should start with beauty, if that makes sense. No, you can, you can use terms like delight, right? Which is, to the empathy point, you're, you're trying to anticipate what a user wants to get done and, what, and why they're using that product. And the moments of delight come when it just works for you. You just didn't even think about it. It was completely intuitive. It worked. It did exactly what I wanted. And I think somewhere in there between that sort of delight idea and the simplicity, you can find something. <coughs> the word we often use is elegance. That's what we want, an elegant solution. Something that's easy to use, looks great, it's engaging, but it's not complex, it's simple. Complex, I mean, complexity is really interesting. I mean, and you guys have like, lots of requirements in, in, in sort of HR software, right? And you know, we have a design principle, we have a lot of design principles, but one of them is that to gracefully reveal depth, because sometimes you can't simplify a process. There are, it is a complex process. There's a lot of steps needed or whatever. But you can try to sort of step people into it or through it and, and gracefully reveal the depth and complexity rather than giving it to them all up front, right? So it may still actually be as many functions or widgets at the, at the end of the day, but how you show them those can be really important. It's, uh, it's funny listening because the parallels are, are very similar. We, we talk about habit formation. And habit formation actually begins with really simple tasks. And you're essentially building a story and an unveiling with the user. You start with something really simple. If you do this, you get something back that you value. And you constantly are working through that path. I mean, if you actually look at a lot of the consumer products that we use, software products, um, many of them started incredibly simple. They become enormously complex over time, and they reveal themselves. But if you even recall like your first experiences with a Facebook or with an Instagram, which now are very complex and contain all kinds of interaction principles, they started incredibly simple. Mm -hmm. And so I think the parallel for us is in that habit formation. You're looking for the, I did something, I got something back, and then you sort of reveal the next part of the story to the user. Okay. So simplicity is a theme that keeps coming up and again and again. What, what's the intersection of simplicity and innovation? I mean, it, it, how, you know, on a small screen um, or on a, on a you know, PC screen, on a, on a web browser, how much can you innovate if you're trying to simplify? 
I'll take an example, but um, so we, we launched a product that we called uh, the Yahoo News Digest. Mm -hmm. And the insight there was pretty, pretty basic, which was all of us consume infinite amounts of news and information. We've become very used to, especially on touch screens, being able to digest massive streams, right? If you actually think about how much you're reading and how much you're receiving on that touch screen, you're parsing through tens, 20, 30 stories at a time. The challenge that we had was in that world of infinite, you never actually felt informed or complete. So you've kind of left saying, do I actually know what's going on? No, you just entered into a stream and left a stream at some point. So I do think you can find innovation and in really getting at the core. Our innovation for the Yahoo News Digest was how do you inform the world and let people know that they're in the know in a very small, frankly, 45 seconds amount of time twice a day. And that notion of being able to feel complete, uh, that was, well, in our opinion, a, an innovation in the news area where you can do s lots of reduction and lots of simplicity on a small screen and have an innovation. A lot of the innovation is, in fact, making the complex simple. That is, in itself, the innovation in many ways, where you take a process that might be somewhat convoluted and somewhat difficult involving multiple inputs from multiple different sources, and you're presenting it in a way that is extremely understandable for anybody who needs that data or needs that information. So you're taking something complex and you're making it simple. I would go to Adam's earlier, this Adam, sorry. This Adam. Um, uh, you know, when you talk about small screen size, it's just a constraint, and mm -hmm. innovation actually works best under constraint. It's quite hard to innovate with zero constraints. Yeah. Like, it's actually really, really difficult to do, as soon as you tell people you've got 24 hours or your screen size is this big or you've only got two people or you've got a week to do it, then they, you know, they have a limited size box and they can sort of see the borders and then they can innovate within that. So actually I think it makes it a bit easier to, to, to innovate when you've got constraints Great. like that. Okay. Um, um, Jason, you guys are in the business of completely reinventing photography with this new technology, which we won't get into. Your first product, was very beautiful. Um, it was, did not look like a camera. It was this sort of square tube um, and uh, very slick. Um, it seems like, I mean, that was, it was very innovative, but was it a step too far? I mean, people are used to certain things when they think of a camera. It seems like from your version 2.0 of your product, which is yeah. sitting there somewhere, which actually does look like a camera that you, you did go too far. Yeah, I'd, I'd describe it as I think we went through the classic experience that, that most startups go to, right? When before you've shipped any product at all, you have basically zero market data and feedback around what's going to work and not, what's not going to work. And, and you want to uh, kind of really push the envelope of what, what you can do. Um, I think that the, our, our first generation camera was super successful in, uh, in terms of getting Lytra on the map in terms of dis uh, establishing this kind of iconic form. Uh, and then what we found was that 100% of the people who bought that product already owned at least one high-end camera, like a DSLR. Uh, and so it became very clear as we went to do the second generation that we wanted it, I mean, and, and those people were very clear uh, in terms of what they wanted from us. They wanted more power, more power, uh, more capabilities, more features. And so as we went to think about the second generation, what we wanted to do was give them something that felt a little bit more familiar, but that also uh, kind of pushed the design envelope. So you know, in a, in a traditional high-end camera, it'll, the, the back will be festooned with 47 different bu buttons. Yeah, you know, feel we free have four to buttons and, and a big, bright, beautiful touch screen. And a lot of the, uh, the, the, the basic things that you want to do in terms of capturing a picture uh, are all implemented in tactile and physical controls, and all of the things that you do less frequently, like changing settings, that are that's all done through touch. So that that was a big, uh, big evolution in learning for us. So, and when I look at that, it looks a little bit like a DSLR. Uh, one obvious difference is there's a slanted back, which seems like an obvious thing, you know, especially in this day and age where we're not looking through a viewfinder. Um, talk about how you guys came up with that. Yeah, so that, that actually drove a lot of our thinking, right? So uh, if, you, if you look at how photography has worked for the last 175 years, right, we've trained people to, to put the camera right up close to their face, block the world out around them. Uh, and then last 
five or seven years, we've seen the evolution of smartphone and tablet photography, which is totally different, right, where you're holding the device out in front of you, and it's a much more uh, social, engaging way to take pictures. Uh, and so part of what you're seeing here is this is a blending of a new style of photography with a powerful high-end product. And so, you know, the way that you hold it is out in front of you like this, so you can still frame the shot. You know, the screen articulates so you can uh, get it exactly the way that you want it, uh, but you're not, you're not having to block out the entire world around you. And so that, we, we did a lot of user testing around this and, and really evolved this thinking as we went to design the product. And for anybody who's interested, uh, it's going to be on sale, what, in about 10 days? Uh, in about July 31st. <laughs> but it'll set you back it. about 1600 bucks. <laughs> but only 1500 if you order before July 31st. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I want to go to questions in a minute, so please start um, start thinking about questions. Um, when do you bring in um, customer insights into your process? So I think customer insights are always there. I mean, you're usually creating a process or a product based on an insight. I mean. I guess one of the examples that we use recently was um, if you actually watch what people do when they're using their email clients, the question that we had is why are people pulling refresh all day long? And the insight is that it's like we want more. What, what else is there? Give me more information. What else have you got for me right now? And so when we looked at that and we actually started to uncover what was really behind that, and it's a really simple use case. It's called boredom. And so essentially what people were doing is they were bored, and they're just pulling refresh all day long. And so what we did in our but, mail client. But, but if they're pulling refresh, presumably they're hoping for another incoming email. They're hoping Somebody for cares it. about me. So, show yeah. me something that I yeah. should care about is what they're really asking themselves. Like the mental dialogue is, what's here for me? And what we did was we basically used that insight to bring together news and information and our mail client. And we designed that whole experience around And that. how do you know people want news and information when the, the act of hitting refresh is to see if somebody wrote to me? Uh, well, what you, start to, what you start to look at is the behaviors. And you really, you can watch and engage with people and ask questions. And once you start to get those kind of Aha, that's why. I mean, I love the fact that that's slanted, right? To me, that's a huge insight, which is why is it that people hold a camera up to your face, which blocks out the rest of the world? It's those kinds of questions that designers ask and product people ask. You start with a why. Why does this have to be this way? And then you get to a want, which is I want X. And those are kind of the, the kinds of consumer insights. And then it gets into data and analytics. And then you look at Am I actually doing the right thing by our users? Yeah. I think we, we I mean, again, we, we talk about empathy a lot, but we talk about you know, listening and understanding the customer or the end user need, but not obeying their mm. requests. Because <laughs> sometimes they'll say, put this button over here. And you, rather than move the button, you need to kind of think, well, why, why, you know, and ask them why they're asking for that. And they may not want a button at all, or they may want something different. And it's kind of our job as product designers to give them what they didn't expect. They're not going to ask for things. But if we're not listening, we're not going to be able to, to build that. Um, and listening can be you know, everything from user research and direct user testing through analytics and everything else, right? You need a sort of full gamut of ways to listen. You guys have a corporate motto or a, whatever you want to call it that uh, it's a question that says, are we screwing with our customers except sure. you don't use the word screwing, you use a different one. <laughs> uh, how do you know, like, how do you know when you're screwing with your customer? Uh, it's actually usually quite easy to tell, right? A lot of business is unfortunately about adding friction to gain sales leverage to gain something else. And if you, you know, if you spend enough time sitting in the customer's shoes or their seat or whatever, and it's usually not too hard to see if adding this thing is going to screw the customer or the end user. It's, it's, not, it's not a hard, it can be very hard to fix the problem, but actually understanding is, are the, is their life better off or worse off if I do this is usually not. It's usually not that hard to, to figure out for, for people. And uh, you, Adam, when, when you changed, you, you went from not being a design-driven company to being a design-driven company. How, you know, you don't want to shock the system of your customers who are used to something. How did you walk that line? So we've always been very customer-driven. So we have about 15,000 features in the software today. Just about every single one came from a client or prospect. 
And they were very involved in the requirements gathering, the design, everything else. But when we switched this idea of a modern interface, a consumer-like interface, we had to do it in such a way that the client could keep the old version for a period of time to manage the change management within their company. Mm -hmm. so we actually couldn't just turn the dial. It's a, this is interesting because as a Yahoo customer, so many times you guys, I mean, this may be before you joined, but they would do a new mail client, but you'd leave the old version there because you've got, you know, 500 million users yep. there, and you don't want people to say, oh, this, this is awful. I don't want to use it and, and lose, you know, 100 million yep. users overnight. So how, how do you do that today? I, look, this is one of the toughest challenges, right? At the end of the day, nobody typically wakes up and says, gee, I wish you would redesign this product that I use every day. It's the same in magazines. All right, it's especially around utilities. But what you really drive at is, how do I help you accomplish your goal? And how do I make that easier for you? Um, and part of it is, there is friction in learning a new system, but it should feel familiar. I, an example for mail, since you pulled it up, I mean, one of the things that we did when we designed our mobile mail client was we actually focused our core experience on how do I reduce the amount of time that it would take you to do the tasks that you typically do in your mobile client? And we basically stripped out through processes of triage. We were able to figure out that we could get you to accomplish what you wanted to do in take a minute out of your user per day. So a minute less time that it would require you to finish those tasks. And the amazing thing that happens is when you build something that performs for users, they give you back that time. It's like a law of fixed uh, time. How do they give you back? So quite literally, we stripped out a minute of time if you looked at the tasks that you would do. Not only did they give us back that minute of time, but they added a minute of time per user per day. Meaning they were using that using, product or another Yahoo product? Using the mail product for an additional minute per user per day. And the bizarre thing is, you actually end up writing more email and reading more email. Mm -hmm. So there was latent demand there that was basically performance. I mean, one of the things that I think all of us probably would tell you is performance. Literally, how fast and how efficient does your product serve that need is one of the single most important attributes. And you take out time in a user's day, and they will be delighted, and they will give you back more time. Right. I think, I think that, I mean, the, the last thing I want to chip in there, the, the, the notion of massive product transitions, the way that modern software is built, SaaS, even, even on-prem software, is much more nowadays about lots of small iterations, yeah. which is where having that kind of concept car design, where do we want to get to in a year and a half, yeah. and what are the stages we can walk the user base through, rather than saying, here's our you know, three-year release of Excel or whatever, it's totally different right. now, and then we need to invest a huge amount in training and everything else. If we can kind of get them to bite off that change in small pieces, it's, it's a lot easier to make those transitions. That's a, a massively important point, because I think one of the challenges that Yahoo faced was not having evolved at all. Mm -hmm. And I think when you end up in that position, you're stuck with a seismic change, and that is very difficult, as opposed to you should be doing releases every single day, and it should just be an evolutionary process. You can't do that, but anyway, uh, questions from the audience <laughs> over here. Hi, I'm Jennifer from Rent the Runway. I have a question for Adam. You brought up a point about habit creation, and I just wanted to hear some examples from you of things and applications that Yahoo worked on that weren't traditionally habits and how you simplified the user experience to create a few of those. Sure. Um, habits, um, you really want to start with as simple a premise as possible, in my opinion. I think you want to end up in an experience where there's an action and then there's a value exchange back and forth. So the simplest one that I can give, truthfully, is the News Digest. It starts, it's a really simple idea, which is twice a day, you basically are going to feel rewarded because you're going to feel like you've completed something. It's completion-based news. So what do we do? We alert you. Your digest is ready. You open it up. You flip through it. It takes you 40 seconds. Boom, reward. It tells you like a piece of insight that you didn't know. And you feel a little bit of that gamification of completion. That type of habit cycle led to a 50% adoption rate for daily use. 
So literally 50% of people who download that application become daily users. That's unlike most products out there in mobile. Uh, I mean, there are some products, obviously, that, that do that. I believe that if you can really get those simple reward mechanics between you and your users down, you can start to build that. And then you can take them on a more complex journey. I mean, you just don't want to start with, like, here's 50 things that you have to learn in order to even engage here. This habit come into play for any of you? I mean, enterprise software, you have to use it, right, if you're doing your job? Not for us. I mean, that's the thing. Was, all our products are bottom-up adopted. They're very viral. It's spreading from one team to another team to another team. So yeah, I mean, habit forming, we don't, I guess we don't really refer to it like that, but that it's, it's really important, right? If it doesn't do what they need it to do and they don't get their job done, then they're not gonna use it on the next job, the next team, or invite other users in. I just add to what Adam said, they've done, I mean, I'm, I'm one of your 50%, and you guys have done some really clever things, right? Like the, um, you know, the sound that the app makes when, you're, when your news comes is different than kind of the, the sound that any other app uh, has so th there's kind of design branding in those in the sounds which people don't think about very often. So when I hear it, I know it's like time to go read my news and get the reward. And there's a bunch of little things like that that you can do that make a big, big difference to people. That's the joy element where you know I think all of us, uh, when you really love products, you spend a lot of time thinking about like how do I bring some joy, some delight into a user's life, and it could be a placement of something or how things work could be a sound. It's just something that you want to exchange. Question over here. My former Identify boss. Identify yourself. Yes. Please don't beat me up, Blake. You can hear me. Just <laughs> So um, you spoke a little bit about the tension between product management, engineering, and design. Right? Is it working? Now? It is. Good. Can you identify yourself? So my Blake Irving, CEO of GoDaddy. Um, you talked a little bit about the tension between product management, engineering, and design. You guys are all have different product lines, and there's a bunch of different ways to solve it. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just each of you, just kind of talk about how you manage the tension, which is sometimes intentional and actually produces better products, between those three functions, and who's the tiebreaker when they disagree. Yeah, I'll start with, I, I seek to create that tension. Uh, because I think that when, when you have, I mean, the, you, know, you got to start with the idea that uh, every group, every team, every executive has the best uh, interest of the company at heart. Uh, and, and when they're each pushing each other in different ways, kind of great things are going are gonna to happen. And I'd say more often than not, I end up being the tiebreaker if they can't. But, but first, I always go tell them to, that they need to resolve it themselves. And if they can't, that's when I'll jump in. So yeah. we have a creative team, a product management team, and a development team. The product managers will determine what they're working on. The creative team will take what the requirements are and design against it, and the developers will build it. So it's really up to the product managers, and they get to override the developers, even if something will take longer. Then it just becomes a question of, are you willing to invest that much time to get it done? I mean, I think that tension is, is important. I think we, we think about them as three equal peers. They have to be seen as peers, um, firstly. Secondly, we, you know, on any team, you then say, well, who's in charge and who's the tiebreaker? We have a number of devices to do that. First is there's a single directly responsible individual on each of those teams who's in charge of getting across the line, but the team wins or loses as a team. So if they all understand that, then they have empathy for each other's jobs. If design, you know, design's wonderful things, but engineering says I can't deliver it, team loses. So they've got to kind of understand each other's roles, and that's where shifting the leadership around is really interesting because then different people have to speak. When you've got designers in charge saying, I don't think engineering can build that, and they get it right, that's when you have that, that peer understanding amongst uh, you know, all of those people. Um, the other thing we talk about is the, the sort of the notion from lean of having an end on cord that you can pull on, the, on, the, on the, the factory line if it's not good enough. I want every single person to be able to pull that cord, right? And that's, that's the really hard thing. When we pump, someone says this is not good enough to go out, that takes a lot of guts, but everybody should be able to say that on that team. And you know, I want an engineer to say, this is not good enough from a design perspective and push him and create some of that tension, right? And say it's not good enough because it can't always come to me or the GM or whoever up the chain to pull that cord and say it's not good enough. In the early days, it used to always be found as to say, no, we need to stretch a bit further. We need to go back around on this. You kind of have to drive that organizationally down and to say that's okay, which means dates are gonna suffer, marketing's gonna be upset, whatever. That has to be the higher order bit, right? That, that the product has to be the best product. And if we start from that perspective, then you know, they have to be able to 
pull it off the line effectively, virtual line, whatever. I guess I would add, um, I do try to put in constraints because I think back to that point, which is at the end of the day, the biggest cycles of innovation, in my opinion, come from having some constraint. You have to design around something. Um, so I try to establish a set of constraints. It could be a ship date. It could be a value premise or something that we're trying to accomplish. I also think, as crazy as it sounds, I also think truly um, building a collaborative environment and how people physically work together is really critical. One of the things that we did, and it's kind of, you know, it's become a bit more lore than anything, um, we basically took, okay, design, product, engineering, we all sit around tables together. And creating that collaborative environment, literally at Yahoo, was removing the cubes because people were in their world. And I believe that that's how you solve a lot of these things. I also think um, you try to start small. I think unyieldy teams cause a lot of the challenges because when you're in that early iterative phase, if there's too much engineering power behind it, you basically you end up in a world where the engineering team is just like frustrated and can't get to where they're trying to go because there's too much going on. So we tend to start pretty small. And, and I think we use some rules of thumb, which may be helpful to people, but uh, usually you have sort of one designer, one to two designers, to one to two product managers. You try to keep that balanced to something like 10 to 12 engineers on an early team. So you're kind of in like a 15-person type of pod, if you can, because that's where you can actually really start to build and create, and then you scale from there. It's amazing. Let me ask you a we question. We have exactly the same ratio, by the way. So we have one product manager to one designer, one tech writer, one QA person, one product marketer to 10 engineers. That's, yeah. So it's a 15 so person. The golden, the golden ratio. There's something around that. So uh, let me ask you a quick ratios. question and then go back to the, to the audience. How you want to be a design driven company or product manager, how do you measure ROI? You're going to your CFO and you say, I need X number designers because what? It's going to produce this result in us selling this product? We, we don't. I actually went to my CFO and said, we need to invest much more heavily in design. Well, I you're the boss. I can't give you a spreadsheet. <laughs> but I, I should still be, have to justify that. I actually yeah. said to him, I cannot give you a spreadsheet for why this yeah. is. You just need to have trust that in, in a number of years, this will pay off, and it's a big investment for us. Do you go to Marissa, and uh, you're not the boss, the ultimate boss? Yeah, I mean, but, but it's never been justified like that. Uh -huh. I think we, we do stick by ratios and concepts, and we look at things like, these are how many products we're working on. This is what the right team scale is. This is the right balance that we need. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't build products. Like, you literally can't ship if you don't have those dimensions right. Okay. We look at this as existential, where if we didn't do this, then we would, in a relatively short period of time, become obsolete. OK. Final question from the audience over here. We got two minutes. Uh, hi, I'm Travis Katz, CEO of Googlebot, and this is a question for all of you, but you know, a lot to Adam. So, the the question of when when is too much design? When 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 can you have too much design? So you can, you and Marissa both came out of a Google environment where it was very much UX centric, usually not very pretty products. Um, what you guys are doing at Yahoo, I think, is much more sort of the Apple model, where there's actually a lot of investment, in sort of the polish and the details. But sometimes those polishing details can drag timelines out very long. How do you decide what the right balance is between a product that is very clear to understand, a user gets it, but it maybe isn't a wow product versus let's spend another two months making it really shine? And how do you draw that line? That's an impossible question and a great one. I don't, uh, there's no perfect answer to that. And I think at some level, Marissa's job is editor in chief, and she has to say, it's ready to go. And she'll look at every last product before it ships and say, is that's worthy of our name and we're ready to go with it. Um, I, do, I do think, though, mobile in particular has dramatically changed this. I mean, you mentioned the Google, like the time when I was at Google was a very different set of questions that we were optimizing for. It's very much a scientific endeavor, right? Change this color, drive this click. Change this background, drive this click. Very different so, model. So it all comes back to Steve Jobs, the smartphone. 
it, it really kind of forced this whole conversation you're all talking you're about. You're immersed all, in that screen. Yeah. You're touching that thing. Yeah. It's the most personal device you have ever experienced. Yeah. At the same time, I think it comes back to jobs in the early days, though. If you go to the early jobs, here's sort of our design team has a set of principles and guidelines that they're, they're published. You can search for them. We, we put them all online, et cetera. But um, it has to start from a set of principles that your design team buys into, right? And sort of the Steve Jobs real artist ship is a really important principle because, yeah, you can keep painting, you can keep painting, and you can keep painting, but at some point you don't have a product unless it gets out the door. All right. You need your design team to understand that. On that note, we have to end. Thank you very much to our panelists, Jason, Adam, Mike, Adam. And um, we start again at 2.45 in this room, so we'll see you back in here. Thanks very much. Yeah, we go.